covering about a third of the Earth's total land area, the Pacific Ocean is by far the largest body of water on the planet. Given this almost incomprehensible size, it is somewhat surprising to many that the land of the Pacific, that being what is above water, is just as diverse and fascinating as the ocean itself. The Pacific borders five of the Earth's seven continents, and at each intersection has fascinating interactions with the local environment, such as here in College Fjord, Alaska, where glaciers calve into icebergs and drift around the Bering Sea for years. However, for this video, I would like to focus on what is considered quintessentially Pacific, the three niches. The names of these three regions were coined by the French explorer James Dumont d'Urville, Polynesia, or many islands, Micronesia, or small islands, and Melanesia, or black islands. Yeah. Besides this obviously superficial categorization, there is a more effective one, near and remote Oceania. Near Oceania, excluding Australia, occupies the vast majority of the land area of the continent, consisting of such massive islands as New Guinea, second in size only to Greenland, New Britain, and Guadalcanal and is in general the part of the Pacific that has been settled for the longest time, over 60,000 years in some parts. The other division, remote Oceania, is all those islands far enough apart that it required complex sailing technology to reach them. Around 3,500 years ago, Austronesians migrating south from modern-day Taiwan brought this technology with them, and were the first groups able to reach these much more distant islands. For the purposes of simplicity, I will use the Nisias and Near and Remote Oceania together to compare and contrast different regions. But keep in mind that the generally more scientifically significant classification is the latter. Notable locations in Remote Oceania include much of Dorville's three Nisias, that being archipelagos like Fiji, Samoa, and New Zealand, and islands such as Tahiti, Pohnpei, and Rapa Nui. With that basic introduction out of the way, it's time to focus on some of the specifics. What makes up these islands? Being such a diverse collection, there is no universal answer, but rather a number of categories that most Pacific islands fall into. The largest islands, like New Guinea, New Zealand, and New Caledonia, are composed of continental crust, the latter two being remnants of the famous submerged continent of Zealandia. Many of these islands are as ancient as the continents we are familiar with, and have been around since before the dinosaurs. However, interestingly, there are some small islands that are also of continental origin. The island of Yap, about 750 miles off the coast of the Philippines, was formed by a small uplift of the Philippine plate. The second major category is volcanic, or high islands. These islands were all formed by volcanic activity in some way or another. Though some were formed from volcanoes in the ring of fire that surrounds the Pacific, the majority of remote Oceanian islands were formed by hot spots in the massive Pacific Plate, small protuberances of the Earth's mantle in the middle of tectonic plates. Some of the most famous archipelagos of remote Oceania were formed in this way, including Hawaii, the Societies, and the Samoan Islands. These islands are formed quickly in geological time. For example, the Big Island of Hawaii is only about 700,000 years old, and their effects on other islands is especially profound. Studies have found that the immense amounts of mass and magma pushed up to create these islands actually has some very interesting effects, pushing down the crust in their area and even slightly altering the length of the day as mass is distributed more or less evenly around the planet. While the other two types of islands have relatively cut and dry formation, the last major group, atolls, is not quite so simple. There are a number of theories as to how these interesting islands form, and it appears that none of them are wholly true. To start, let's review what an atoll is. Atolls differ from continental and volcanic islands in that they generally have minimal land above water. Most of the area contained in the atoll is in the shallow lagoon, which is a type of sheltered cove that the atoll's land area surrounds. Mind you, this is different from islands like Bora Bora, which are high islands that also have lagoons, as their lagoons are composed of the caldera of the extinct volcano that formed them. Atolls undergo a different process entirely, and atoll formation is a fascinating topic I would love to delve deeper into at a later date. However, I would like to at least outline the prevailing theory, which replaced Charles Darwin's earlier one. The gist is that during the ice ages, sea levels lowered frequently as water was trapped in polar ice caps. 
This exposed flat-topped seamounts composed of carbonate rocks like limestone, which through a complex series of chemical interactions were slowly dissolved by the small amount of acid in rainwater. Famous atolls include the massive Ontong Java, much of the Tuamotu Archipelago, and many of the outer Hawaiian islands, including Midway Atoll. This brings up the confusing fact that Midway was likely formed volcanically, but again, I will save that for another time. Now that we have some of the basics of geology out of the way, it's time to talk more about the specific archipelagos and cultural regions of Oceania. It is worth noting that of the three Nisias, only Polynesia is homogenous. Micronesia has seven main cultural groups, and Melanesia has hundreds. Some Melanesian spots, like Vanuatu, have dozens of ethnic groups in an area the size of Qatar. Thus, while the entire Polynesian Triangle is roughly one cultural region, small areas such as the Fly River Delta in New Guinea are one too, as their extended time to develop has led to immense diversity. To start, let us look at Polynesia. While, as I mentioned earlier, Polynesian culture is relatively similar no matter where you go, this does not mean that there are not notable differences. One of the great divides here is between West and East Polynesia. This division is not purely geographic, as East Polynesia actually reaches further west than West Polynesia does, but rather corresponds to settlement patterns. As Austronesians moved into remote Oceania, they encountered first the archipelagos of Samoa and Tonga. Without going into detail on Polynesian expansion, the West, consisting of Samoa, Tonga, and their close environs, became relatively isolated due to the nature of the settlement, leading to the Society Islands developing into the cultural center of East Polynesia. Voyages were launched from there that discovered or conquered the three corners of the Polynesian Triangle, Hawaii, New Zealand, and Rapa Nui. Next is Micronesia, likely the least known of the three to the Western listener. One can guess the general quality of these islands by their Durvillian title, small islands in Greek. So small, in fact, that the largest island in all of Micronesia, Guam, is about 5% the size of the big island of Hawaii. Micronesia's seven cultures, ranging from Palawan in the west to Ikiribas in the east, are astonishingly complex in their shipbuilding, culture, and relations to nature. My personal favorite archaeological site in all the Pacific is here. Nan Madol on Pompeii, something I will definitely devote time to in the future. Micronesia's settlement was unique, having had considerably more outside influence in parts than the isolated islands of Polynesia. Austronesians, passing through the northernmost Philippines, came into western Micronesia where they settled. From here they expanded east, and came into contact with voyagers from Fiji and Samoa in areas like Kiribati and Nauru, where they formed fascinating syncretic cultures. There are fewer archipelagos in Micronesia as a whole, and so I find it reasonable to name them all. From west to east, we see Palau, the Carolina Islands, the Marianas Islands, Nauru, which is not an archipelago but still very distinct, the Marshall Islands, and Kiribati. Finally, we have Melanesia. This region is the oldest and the most diverse, as well as having by far the greatest land area. New Guinea alone is considerably larger than Texas, and the various archipelagos of near Oceania within Melanesia are larger in size than most in Pali and Micronesia. Melanesia's exact age of settlement is still up for debate, but there is no debate that it is ancient. Some evidence suggests that New Guinea may have been settled by indigenous Papuans for as long as 70,000 years, and it is obvious in the sheer amount of cultural diversity. Ethnologue lists a total of 1,073 languages on the island, about one-seventh of the world's total. Other islands, such as the Solomons, were settled soon after, and once Austronesian sailing technology reached near Oceania, Papuans and other early residents of the area made use of them to reach Vanuatu, New Caledonia, and Fiji. Again, Melanesia is not homogenous, but there are some general classifications that can be made, most notably among Papuans. Places like Fiji have more in common with Samoa and Tonga culturally than with highland agriculturalists from New Guinea. However, relatively vague regions do exist. The whole island of New Guinea, though appallingly diverse, is still closely related enough to be grouped. And despite what some may believe, there is no real difference between the western and eastern halves of the island, regardless of who the Dutch killed 200 years ago. <clears throat> Indonesia. Moving on, the Solomon Islands and Vanuatu, famous for their world-class kava, 
are among the most diverse regions of the Pacific. New Caledonia is largely populated by one ethnic group, the Kanaks, which is interestingly a Hawaiian loanword. Fiji is an interesting case. Originally divided among the Rotumans, Lao, and Itauke people, but since the introduction of Indian workers en masse during the era of British colonialism, a large, era, a large population of Indo-Fijians has emerged in the nation. Melanesia is also home to a large number of Polynesian outliers, exclaves on isolated islands with Polynesian culture from Samoan and Tongan settlers. Overall, the world of Oceania is a fascinating one. Home to a large and interesting set of archipelagos and islands, and just as many diverse and fascinating ethnic groups, there is much to see and learn, even excluding the also incredible continents of Australia, Asia, and the Americas. I hope that this brief introduction to the geology and human geography of the region was interesting. I hope to be releasing a video every second Sunday from now on. Stay tuned! All of my sources are down below, and I highly recommend checking some of them out. Thank you so much for watching. Bye!